Hello and good morning. I'm Dr. Mike Arnold, Children's Hospital of Colorado and the University of Colorado in the Anschutz Medical Campus. I'm pleased to be live again on Instagram. Uh, had some great questions last time. Sorry, we couldn't get that recorded. So I, th I think I figured out how to record this one. Uh, I, one, one question I wanted to answer again really briefly just for this recording was what got me interested in pediatric pathology? What do I like about my job? What's hard about my job? Uh, so I'll start with that real quick and then we'll show some cases. So I did a PhD and when I was doing my PhD, uh, I got interested in genetics and development. It was, it was in a mouse lab, it was on uh, genetics and development. And then when I was a, finishing medical school, my wife was a resident in pathology and you know she was working eight to five while I was doing Q3 overnight call in Parkland Hospital for trauma surgery. So she got me interested in pathology. And then when I started doing pathology rotations as a medical student, one of the first ones I did was pediatric pathology. And right away, a uh, couple days in, we were talking about a liver biopsy in a patient who had algal syndrome. And it was really, really amazing to me because we were talking about the genetics of algal syndrome and what was causing this patient's liver disease. And instantly it was things that were familiar to me as uh, as somebody who'd done a PhD in genetics and development, we were talking about notch signaling. And I was like, this is amazing. So it was a field of pathology where you had access to interesting specimens. And at the same time, we were talking about the genetics and development pathways that I'd always been interested in uh, throughout my education and, and in graduate school. So I was going to show some cases today. And I put this one up on social media as a bit of a tease for this, uh, for this live. So I'm going to focus on kind of really basic pediatric pathology cases today. And in particular, I'm going to focus on things that I think are going to make you look like a superstar when you do a rotation with a pediatric pathologist. So this one, <clears throat> this one is a, a kind of cystic lesion on a child's face. And when medical students and residents see this for the first time, they immediately go to the areas like this on the slide that are really, really blue. So you have this epithelium that's really primitive looking, really basophilic, and this makes people nervous and they don't know what it is. And, you know, it, it wouldn't be upsetting in an adult to think that this might be a basal cell carcinoma or something weird, uh, but that's not all that's here. So when you look around, you get clues to what's really going on. And the first clue is this keratin right here. So this kind of... Uh, lacy looking ghosts of, of epithelium, if you will, is is a really good clue. They call this wet keratin or ghost keratin because what you see here is you see the outlines of these keratinocytes of these skin cells, but they lack their nuclei. They're dead. They're, they're gone. Uh, so we call these ghost cells. And this is a, a fantastic clue to what this is because when you see these cells, you see ghost cells. <coughs> you also see calcifications. And associated with that, you're also going to see foreign body giant cells. And here we go. Here's some multinucleated foreign body giant cells. And so when you have that combination of wet keratin, foreign body giant cells, and calcifications, you know this is a pilometricoma. <clears throat> so pilometricomas are benign. Uh, and what's interesting about them is they, they really have a lot of different looks uh, throughout the life of the patient. So in a younger patient, you're going to have more of this basaloid epithelium. But in an older patient, this might be completely gone, and you might only see areas like this that have the wet keratin calcification and the foreign body giant cell reaction. And the natural history of these is they're just going to progress to a, a very calcified nodule. Now, since these are on the face or the head and neck, <coughs> cosmetically, that may be undesirable, so you're going to want to see these come off. But you don't need to worry about margins or anything. They're benign. They're not going to recur. Here's another cyst from the face. This is actually from the lip. And you see right away <clears throat> that you have a cystic structure. But this cystic structure doesn't have a lining to it. It's all, the entirety of the lining is these really foamy histiocytes. And there's no epithelium left. But what's important to figure this one out is to look what's around it. So immediately deep to this. Let me go back for a second. Here's the surface. Here's the, the lip. Here's our cystic structure. And then deep to it, we have this duct. 
and a minor salivary gland. And you'll see the minor salivary gland also has some chronic inflammation. You see these lymph lymph lymphocytes, mixed chronic inflammation. And so, you know, this is a mucosal. What this is, is this is a plugged duct for that sal minor salivary gland. And that plugged duct has ruptured. And because it's ruptured, you see that the <clears throat> lining epithelium is gone. And all you have along the lining is these foamy histiocytes. So even without the epithelium, you can see from what's nearby what this actually is. So feel free to chime in if you have any questions, if you have any specific topics you want me to chat about. Uh, I'll just keep going and show a few more things. So the next one I've got is another cyst from the face. Just to show you, there's a range of things you're going to find in cysts. And at low power, this is a fairly empty looking cyst. And as you get closer, you can see that what's in it is all this keratinaceous debris. So these are sloughed squamous cells. And so there's a couple things that that could be just by knowing that. And that's either an epidermal inclusion cyst or a dermoid cyst. And the difference is in the lining. In an epidermal inclusion cyst, <coughs> you're not going to see adnexa in the wall like you are here. So here you see skin adnexa. You see a hair shaft that's kind of compressed up against the wall of the cyst. And here's a sebaceous unit that's also compressed against the wall. And you can see that it actually is connecting to the lumen. And if you look in the lumen, you'll also find that there's hair. And a lot of times you can see this grossly. When you open these up at the gross bench, you'll see this hair. And you'll know right away that it's a dermoid cyst. This one also, in addition to having the nicely preserved keratinizing squamous epithelial lining, it's also got a lot of evidence of rupture. So you can see there's a lot of histiocytes here that are lining this with some foreign body giant cell reaction that are reacting to that keratin because this uh, has broken open at some point. And so that surface that's now effaced uh, by that rupture is replaced by this histiocyte reaction to all the keratin. All right, we're going to shift away from facial cysts for a second. And here's the soft tissue mass. So this soft tissue mass is from, let's say, a young kid. Let's say, you know, two years old or less. And right away, what's going to catch a lot of people's eyes is this branching, delicate capillary vascular network and this myxoid stroma. <coughs> And if this is the first time you've seen one of these, that's going to make you really nervous and make you think about things like myxoid liposarcoma. But thankfully, myxoid liposarcomas don't really occur in children, especially in young kids. But the answer to what this is, is in the cells that are in that myxoid stroma. And here's a really beautiful field where you can see what, what's going on here. So the cells here look kind of like adipocytes, but instead of having one large fat droplet in their cytoplasm. They've got multiple variably sized lipid droplets. And you can see those lipid droplets are actually indenting the nucleus. And the fact that those droplets are indenting the nucleus is the clue to what this is. This is a lipoblast. And so in this lesion, there are many, many lipoblasts. So this is a lipoblastoma, and this is benign. As these, and, and I pointed out that that cell had a lot of variably sized fat droplets. If you see a, another type of cell that might look similar, that has lots of small lipid droplets and a very round nucleus that's not indented, that would be a cell type that's called uh, brown fat. So that type of cell would be characteristic of either normal, normal brown fat or a tumor known as a hibernoma. But this is a lipoblastoma because those nuclei, many of them, are, are obviously indented by these lipid droplets, so the beautiful lipoblastoma. So the natural history of these is as these patients age, this lesion is going to become less myxoid. It's going to have less lipoblasts in it. And it might be a little harder to identify as a lipoblastoma. So here's an example of that. This is an older kid. And as you zoom in on this, you can see the areas of this might pass for a lipoma. But even here, what you might notice is that instead of having a lot of large single lipid droplets, there's some variation in the size of these droplets. 
And if you look around in some areas, you'll even find that there's multiple lipid droplets in the same cell. So that's a little bit unusual for a lipoma. And so if you look at this carefully for a little while, you might find some areas where you also see some of that myxoid stroma again. And if you look along this myxoid stroma, you'll find cells like this that have multiple lipid droplets that are actually indenting the nucleus. So this is another example of a lipoblastoma that just doesn't have many lipoblasts, and the lipoblasts that it does have actually have some larger lipid droplets. So knowing lipoblastoma is really helpful because that's going to help you differentiate it from other things that could be bad, like myxoid liposarcoma. Well, let's go take a look at, let's take a look at, uh, let's see, how about, how about some bone? All right, here is a sort of sessile lesion that was extending off the side of the distal femur. And you see it's got this area of cartilage that at low power is just lining kind of one surface of it. And what's underneath that is fairly look, normal looking trabecular bone and adipose. You might even find some marrow elements in this. So this has bone and cartilage. So we call this an osteochondroma. Osteochondromas are a really interesting developmental phenomenon. This cartilage is hyaline cartilage because you can see it has this kind of solid purple stroma to it. But it's hyaline cartilage from a very particular place in the skeleton. It's from the growth plate. So if you look at this closely, you can see you have all the zones of maturation that you would have in the normal growth plate. So you have resting chondrocytes, you have hypertrophic, hypertrophic chondrocytes that are hypertro undergoing hypertrophy, becoming larger. And then those hypertrophic chondrocytes, are their matrix is mineralizing, as you can see here, this pink uh, where the matrix is being replaced. And that mineralized matrix is being remodeled into bone. So this is exactly the process that's happening in the normal growth plate. What's happening here, though, is that this cartilage has kind of made a wrong turn, and it's headed instead of along the skeleton, it's headed out sideways. And so it's growing out away from the bone. And these are going to come to clinical attention because this is connected, this bone is connected to the medullary cavity. This, this actually changes the structure of the cortex, and so this medullary bone is actually connected to the medullary space of the rest of the bone. So this is going to come to clinical attention when it fractures, because just like normal bone, it's going to hurt. Or if it's uh, impinging on another structure around it, like a vessel or a nerve, and causing pain. This cartilage and this cap is generally going to be thin. And what's in here is going to be hypocellular or marrow. If you see hypercellular spindle cells or other things, you might worry about a malignancy that's arisen from this, like an osteosarcoma or something, uh, but this is clearly benign. And this cap is pretty thin. In kids, and the rule of thumb is two centimeters is, is or less, but in kids, that really isn't as important. What's really important is that this cartilaginous cap, because it came from the normal growth plate, is going to behave like the normal growth plate. So as this patient gets bigger, as their skeleton matures, this cartilage should regress just like the normal growth plate does. So get worried about these lesions when you see that the growth rate of this osteochondroma doesn't match the growth rate of the rest of the skeleton, or if somebody is skeletally mature and this thing is continuing to expand, that could be an indication um, that, that this is transformed into something else. Now, I talked about this cartilage for a second, and I called it hyaline cartilage. There's three types of cartilage in the body. Anybody in the chat want to name a couple of them? All right, so there's hyaline cartilage. It looks like this. It has this purple matrix. There's elastic cartilage, and there's fibrocartilage. 
fibrocartilage is what you're going to find in intervertebral discs. And what that's going to look like is you'll have chondrocytes, you know, single chondrocytes that are surrounded by this wispy kind of fibrous matrix. And then elastic cartilage is going to look like this. It's going to have that similar kind of solid purple look, but it's going to have this kind of glassy pink matrix that's interwoven all throughout the cartilage. This is the type of cartilage you're going to find in the ears or the nose. This is a very flexible cartilage because of this extra pink matrix here. So elastic cartilage is really characteristic of ears and nose, like I said, but it's also found in lesions like this. So this is a polypoid lesion that was present around this patient's ears. And when we take it off, we see that that polypoid piece of fairly normal looking skin has a cartilaginous core or cartilage at the base. And this is another example of mesenchyme, you know, cartilage that ended up in the wrong place. So if you remember developmental biology, you'll remember the branchial clefts are the structures that give rise to many parts of the face. And when those don't develop normally, you can get things like this, where you have this little polypoid piece of tissue, skin, and elastic cartilage. And this is called a branchial cleft remnant, because this is a remnant of the branchial cleft structure that just ended up somewhere it didn't actually belong. So this is a great example of the great contrast of those two types of cartilage. All right, I'm going to show one more. I'll, I'm going to show. I'm going to show a tumor that if you can recognize the features of this tumor when you start your pediatric pathology rotation, you will impress a lot of people, because this is a very classic histologic pattern, but it can have a ton of variation. So even without telling you where this it might is from, somebody in the chat might know what this is and where it came from. So the classic feature of this is that it's described as triphasic. That means there's three components. And the three components you see here are this really poorly differentiated population of cells that doesn't seem to have much structure to it. So you have that, you have this more spindled stroma, and you have these things that look like tubules or epithelial structures. So you have blastema, you have epithelium, and you have stroma. And that's diagnostic of Wilms tumor. Wilms tumor is a renal tumor that's most common. Yeah, Wilms. And thank you, somebody in the chat got it. Uh, most common around age five, but you can see it as, as young as age one, and you can even see it occasionally in teenagers. What I think is really fascinating about Wilms tumor is that you can have so many different histologic patterns to this because the proportion of blastema and epithelium and stroma, there's no rules about how they show up. You can get tumors that are epithelial predominant, you can get tumors that are blastemal predominant, uh, and you can even get an, another really interesting type of epithelial differentiation. So here, here's a different looking histology in the same tumor. And this is actually part of the tumor, this is not the surrounding kidney. And what you see is this tumor is actually trying to make glomeruli. So these glomerulide bodies, these are evidence of epithelial differentiation. And sometimes there's cases I've seen where you only have a handful of these and without any information, that's the only clue that this is a Wilms tumor. Because like I said, these can happen in any proportion, any number of different patterns of how this stroma and epithelium and blastema are all distributed through the tumor. Well, anybody in the chat have any questions about anything we've looked at? Anything you want to see? Anything I can bring for next time? Any questions about pediatric pathology? All right, well, that's some great pediatric pathology basics. Thanks so much for joining. I'll definitely do something like this again. Thanks for being here.